and she's part of our team here, and we're very happy about that. Won't you help me welcome tonight, Sister Sherry Espido. Hallelujah. Thank you, Sister Sherry. Thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity to speak to you all again. How's everyone doing tonight? Hi. I'm looking forward to hearing Linda speak next week. When she speaks, there's a presence and a peace that emanates from her. And then there's me. <laughs> so, so I'm looking forward to the kind of the more peaceful thing, but I'm more like, um, you know, roll up your sleeves, get your gloves on. We're going into battle. I'm the one who has to give a warning before I speak. If you're easily offended, run now. I want to talk to you for a few minutes tonight about women in ministry. Women in ministry, or as the subtitle states, supporting New Testament models of ministry without becoming a raging feminist. I am not a feminist. What I am is a Christian. What I am is a child of God. What I am is the beloved of my Savior. I am his and he is mine. And so I have no doubt or no question as to who I am. People can yell at me. People can get upset with me. People can call me names. It doesn't matter because I am his and he is mine. And so I know who I am in Christ. Now, I wish I could tell you that all of this tonight originated with me. I wish I could tell you that I was that smart. I'm not. It originated with Deborah Gill and Barbara Cavanus from the book entitled God's Women Then and Now. It's available on Amazon for $8.99 or something like that. Um, in the Kindle edition, but you might want to get a hardcover edition and keep it for that grandchild, for that daughter, for that woman who is wondering who she is in Christ. And I remember, for me, it's never been a question about women in ministry because I grew up in the Assemblies of God, and I grew up with my grandmother telling me stories about the woman who pitched a tent in these mountains and had services. I can't remember her name. Anybody? I wish I remembered her name because she had a profound effect on this area and in church planting here. So this church is in some ways the fruit of a woman who came to minister the gospel here. It was just normative. And I think, and here's where the offense can come in, but I think that the closer a group is to the Holy Spirit, the close, the more freedom there is for its members to act out their calling. Hello? And the further away we get from the Holy Spirit, the more bondage or oppression or suppression there is, and the more hierarchy there is. Now, that's just my opinion, so if you like it, you do. If you don't, you don't. Okay? Anyway, I recommend the book. If you have questions after tonight, get it. Get it on your Kindle. You can read it tonight. Stay up all night. It'll be a good investment <laughs> in your time. Look at with me. What we're going to do tonight, we're going to look at some very basics about interpreting the Word of God, and then we're going to look at some specific examples of women in ministry from the Old Testament to Revelation. We might be here a while. Steps in interpreting the Bible. There are two primary questions that biblical interpreters ask. They are, what did this text mean to the original hearers? What did it mean to the original hearers? So Romans 16.16 16 says, greet one another with a holy kiss. I didn't see anybody do that when they walked in today. Now, what did that mean to the original hearers? It meant to greet one another with a holy kiss. Why? Because in the Roman culture, that's how they greeted one another. 
There's a story of a missionary who went to Greece. They were just there, the man and his wife, and the man spoke, and at the end of the sermon, he went to the back of the church, and he shook hand to shake everybody's hand as they were exiting, and the first man came up to him, and he held out his hand to shake his hand, and the man grabbed him by both shoulders and kissed him on the lips. I think I'd have quit right there. I know I'd have quit right there. <laughs> Greet one another with a holy kiss. We understand that that is a specific command for a specific church in a specific time and place. But it, it's a cultural thing. And so what is the principle associated with that? The principle associated with that is to greet everybody. Hey, I don't pretend I don't know you when I'm out at Walmart. Out at Walmart. Of course, I haven't been to Walmart for 15 months, but if I ever go to Walmart, I'll act like I know you. I'll greet you. The second question, how does it apply to us today? So greet one another with a holy kiss applies to us today in that we greet one another. We acknowledge one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. The primary message of the writer was for the original readers. This, it cannot mean what it never meant. Okay? And that's important. We have some tools that we use for interpretation, two primary tools. They're like the hammers and the nails for interpretation, and that is context and content. Everything is context. Your house is on fire. Now, what I did last week was I told all of us collectively that our house was on fire, that we have a problem in our culture, we have a problem in our school system, our house is on fire. That was the context of what I said. Now, if I'm standing at your door at 7.30 in the morning, which I did this week, by the way, and pounding on it to get you up, and you open the door and I say, your house is on fire, that's a different context, right? Right? One is metaphorical. Your house is on fire in that we've got problems. we got trouble. The other is, your house is on fire. Do you have a hose? As I'm calling 911. That was fun. Have you ever seen someone's face when you say your house is on fire? That's a face. I should have videoed, but I wasn't thinking. Context is everything. Everything. And in Scripture, context is everything. There are two types of context, literary and historical. I do not read the Psalms the way I read Revelation. I do not read the prophets the way I read the Gospels. They are different styles of writing for different purposes. And so we have literary context. We have to know the genre. And by the way, if you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, try reading them all in, not all of them, but try reading all of Matthew in one sitting or all of John in one sitting because the authors wrote them to a specific group of people for the purpose of leading them to Christ, and so they are sermons. Okay, so that's why you have, well, Mark says it this way, Luke says it that way. They're telling the same event from four different corners of the intersection. One is looking at it as a Jew, Matthew. Luke is looking at it as a Gentile. They're seeing the same event from different corners. And I can tell the same story completely truthfully in 15 different ways with 15 different emphases. I can tell you a story about prayer or I can tell you a story about faith. Same story. It depends on where I'm, my emphasis is going to be. Does that make sense? So the, the Gospels are sermons written to a specific group of people, all the different types of people Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John cover. That was just extra. Historical. Historical refers to the customs and traditions of the original hear hearers. So when Joel wrote his small prophetic book that said there was a literal locust invasion, the locusts were coming to destroy the crops. It was a literal invasion. In, um, I think this is in 1 Corinthians, it says, 
A woman should learn in quietness and submission. A woman should learn in quietness and submission. When the original hearers heard that, they said, wow, that's revolutionary. A woman should learn in quietness and submission. First of all, a woman should learn? What? Secondly, a woman should learn in quietness and submission. Did you know that was a normal rabbinical saying? That a student should learn in quietness and submission? That when the young boys were going to rabbinical school, they should learn in quietness and submission? All good students learned in quietness and submission? Now, when we hear it today, what? A woman should learn in quietness and submission. We should not. We should talk. We should say what we mean and mean what we say. But that statement, because only the young males were educated, was revolutionary. It was not a negative. It was a positive. Wait, a woman should learn? I should learn? You can go in places in the world today where girls still aren't permitted to learn. But a woman can learn in quietness and submission. Ooh, sign me up, sign me up, sign me up, sign me up. When is it? Where can I go? See how different that is? And yet I get these people who think they know something about God's word online when I use scripture to correct them telling me, you mean to tell me you're reading that misogynistic book that is so against women? What? Do you know Jesus taught in the women's court so that both the men and the women could hear what he was saying? What? The way the scripture teaches about women is revolutionary. But we've lost that because for us it's it's normative. So first, context. Both literary and historical context is critical to understanding scripture. Secondly, content. That is the actual words and the actual grammar. We cannot... We cannot define words and grammar without first knowing the historical and literary context. We get all messed up. What good would it do for us to define your house is on fire and spend 87 books defining what house means in that statement without knowing if it was metaphorical or if it was literal? That's the most important thing. We can't define house until we know if that statement's metaphorical or if it's literal. Yes? Yes. Okay. So, first context, then content. You know what they found? They found that when scholars go with content first and then try to fill in with context, they usually get it wrong. That's what they found, but I won't tell you all that. Categories of meaning, and this is our third and final piece of the lecture on biblical interpretation. There are three categories of meaning in God's word as far as whether or not it applies today or only applied back in the day. Category one is timeless truths. For example, the golden rule, the Ten Commandments, the sins of the flesh, The fruit of the Spirit, these things are timeless. They aren't going to change. They were in Exodus, and then Jesus repeated them. Or Paul repeated them. These do not change. Category two is historical records that may or may not have some normal um, relevance for us today. For example, when Christ rose on Sunday, first day of the week, What happened in the church? We changed the day of worship from a Saturday Sabbath to a Sunday so that weekly we can celebrate what? 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every week is a reminder because we come on the first day of the week to celebrate Christ. Category three is restricted regulations. Those were for people where they were at the time written. Paul to Timothy said, bring your cloak and scrolls. Now, I did not call my son tonight and say, hey, if you're coming to church, bring your cloak and scrolls. We don't have a cloak and we don't have scrolls. So that was in that time. And for that particular purpose. Because we have to remember that the word was written to real people in real places under real circumstances. I kind of like, for example, foot washing is a category two. You ever been to a foot washing service? I've heard of them all my life. And I have run from them all my life. Some churches believe that as an an act of humility, we should wash each other's feet like Jesus did the disciples. I don't think that's normative for today. In the first place, we don't wear sandals and most of us don't walk to church on dusty roads. Now, if you needed your feet washed, I would get a hose and spray them off. But honestly, I don't want to wash nobody's feet. And if that makes me too proud, Lord, I'm sorry. But that's a category two interpretation. Kind of go, you know, either way, whatever, you know, your thoughts are about it. Now, we should not be surprised that the Christian church disagrees about some things. Anybody surprised by that? So if we want to talk about women in ministry, we need to go back to the beginning again which is Genesis. In the beginning, God created. I've lost the guys in the back. In the beginning, God's standard. Here we go. There we go. Back at Adam and Eve. Adam was created by God And Eve was created by God from Adam. So these verses show that both men and women, remember it said, in the image of God created he them. In the image of God created he them. They were both created equally in the image of God. One of the church fathers said that a woman by herself is not in the image of God. But if she is with a man, because the man is in the image of God, the man and the woman are in the image of God. But a woman over here by herself cannot be in the image of God because she was deceived. I think he was deceived. Because the word clearly says they were created in the image of God. And God blessed them. And God commanded them. And God told them to rule over the earth. And take dominion. They were equal in substance, in equality. They were the same in mutuality. They were to rule together as a team. In unity, they were joined as one. And in intimacy, they were to be without shame. That was God's ideal standard. Both man and and woman, both male and female, were to rule and take dominion over the earth in a shared way. That's God's perfect ideal. That's it. Somebody get that. Um, But God's ideal was marred in the garden because of sin. After the entrance of sin, equality was replaced with subordination. Eve was deceived and was the first to sin. That's true. Adam, however, was not deceived but knowingly broke God's command. That's also true. The New Testament stresses the fact that Adam's sin resulted in our all being sinners. 
But because of the sin, equality was destroyed. What did scripture say? God said that the woman's desire would be for her husband and he would what? Rule over her. God was just saying, this is the way it's going to be because this is the way sin works. Sin's going to mess it up. Mutuality was lost. And again, what? Subordination was imposed. Unity was severed. Guilt brought accusations. Well, I thought you were going to do that. Well, I thought you were going to do that. Well, I thought, hmm. Intimacy was destroyed as sin exposed shame. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. It's all a mess because sin damages relationships between people and God, between people and nature, and between people and people. And that's true in any relationship. But sin marred God's ideal, which we saw in the garden. And suddenly women are now subordinate Let's look at the Old Testament. So we have this ideal that God has set with equality, mutuality, unity, and intimacy. And then we have the sin that comes in and messes it up. How does God get us back to the ideal? When does God get us back to the ideal? Because Abraham and Israel were both, both existed in patriarchal societies. Right? Because they were all patriarchal societies. So Abraham and Israel existed in patriarchal societies. But God, as we look through scripture, we're going to see how God was trying to move his people back to the ideal one step at a time. God used both women and men as leaders of the people, even in the strictest patriarchal societies. We have Deborah from Judges 2 to 5. She ruled Israel, and during her reign, she ruled all of it. They had 40 years of peace. Remember Samson, the guy with the hair and the muscles? He was only over a certain tribe. He was only judge over a tribe. Deborah was judge over everything. But it was a patriarchal society. But God's anointing doesn't care what the culture says. Miriam became a prophet in Exodus 15 and she saved Moses' life as a child. Huldah from 2 Kings 22 was a prophetess. The highest Old Testament religious office was prophet. Wasn't priest. There were no women priests. Do you know why? Because in the patriarchal society, women in the priesthood were often, there in the cults, like the cult of Diana or the cult of Artemis, and in different cults, women were priests, and there was a sexual piece to all of that. And so God said, no, we can't go there right now. So instead, God made them prophets. And it was the prophets who corrected the priests. Hello? Just something to think about. Some women acted independently, were permitted to act independently, and were honored for doing so. So we have Hannah, who gave her son to the priesthood. We have Abigail, who saved the life of her foolish husband by intercepting David. I, I didn't call him that. Scripture calls him that by intercepting David on his way to kill him. And we have the Proverbs 31 woman. I just want to be a Proverbs 31 woman. I just want to own businesses and have servants in the morning and servants in the evening. I want to be that Proverbs 31 woman. Anyway, God was moving them back to the ideal one step at a time. So we have the Old Testament, and then we have Jesus' example. And Jesus' treatment of women was revolutionary. Remember the woman at the well? Remember the Samaritan woman? Remember the woman with the issue of blood that was not to be touched? She was unclean, unclean. 
Remember the woman who anointed Jesus. Jewish girls could not go to school, but Jesus taught both men and women. Jesus taught in the women's court so all could hear. Jesus healed men and women. Jesus appeared after his resurrection to who? To a woman first. And Jesus reached out to women who were despised and rejected by society. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Women were the lowest of the low. They were not even created in the image of God. In the rabbinical, the Judaic, the, um, even some of the early church fathers had it wrong. In the New Testament church, and this is my favorite part, so hang on, we're going to go quick here. In the New Testament church, the advent of the church at the day of Pentecost included women. They were in the upper room. Women were part of the promise from the prophet Joel. We talked about Joel last week, and Acts 2 repeats that promise from Joel. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I got a favor from y'all. I need a favor from y'all. You need to pray for our students at Lighthouse. We've got six weeks left of school. About six weeks, that's it. I'd like to see some kids prophesying before it's over. I'd like to see some kids filled with the Spirit before it's over. I'd like to see some kids walking in the fruit of the Spirit before it's over. Hello? Hello? Hallelujah. We've been pouring in and pouring in, and I want to see some fruit. So pray for us. Please, please, please. Pray for us. Both men and women were added to the church. What? Women in the church? They let them come in. I mean, see, it's so common for us. We have forgotten. In the New Testament church, Philip's four daughters prophesied. All people, regardless of social status, age, race, or gender, were qualified for ministry. Read through Luke and Acts and see how many people who were considered the, the bottom of society who Jesus and the Holy Spirit reached out to. In 1 Corinthians 7, marriage is again mutual and reciprocal. It says, the man has authority over the woman's body and the woman has authority over the man's body. What? Yeah, that's what it says. 1 Corinthians 7. Equal respect for believers between the married believers and the unmarried believers. I hate that singles table. I don't sit at that singles table no more. <sighs> okay, 1 Corinthians 11. Unity, equality, and mutuality are restored. Woman is not independent of man, it says. And man is not independent of woman. Huh. Mutuality. Huh. Equality. Head. Whew. Paul used that word, head. The word in the Greek has a lot of meanings. But it does not mean superior rank in 1 Corinthians 11. It means source or origin. God is the source of man. Man is the source of woman. And why would Paul say something like that? Why would he mix things up when he just said man's dependent on woman and woman's dependent on man? Why would he mess that all up? Because the church in Corinth, what my, the church in Ephesus and the church in Corinth had issues with the goddess Artemis, who is the goddess Diana, who claimed that women were the source of all life. So Paul was making clear 
that women were not the source of all life, that God was the source of all life, that God was the one who was in control. Read to the end of the verses. Read to the end of the chapters. God is the source. So Paul was being careful not to build up the heresy that some women were believing that they should marry and they shouldn't have children. Hello? Does that sound like stuff going on today? I don't know. The New Testament church, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, says now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters. I don't want you to be ignorant. Brothers and who? Yeah, there you go. I don't want you to be ignorant. Ephesians 4, God gave to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, who wrote Ephesians? Paul. Who wrote Galatians? Paul. What did Paul say in Galatians? There is therefore now no, no male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Greek. Does Paul contradict himself? No. Does God contradict himself? No. There is internal validity throughout Scripture. So from Genesis through the Old Testament, through Jesus' day, and through the New Testament church, we see God using women as they come out from that sin because when God died and rose on the third day, Women were no longer under the heel of the enemy, but were believers in Christ on the same status and equality at the foot of the cross. Hello? That's not being a feminist, that's being a Christian. Salute Adronius and Junia, my kinsmen and fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles, Junia. Hard to tell what kind of name that is. That's a woman. Who are of note among the apostles, God gave to the church apostles. Apostle is the highest office there is. Junia was a woman and she was an apostle. Don't tell everybody. It's getting quiet in here. <laughs> Starting to sweat. 1 Corinthians 14 says, don't let Laleo, don't let the women keep talking in church. Greek, Laleo. It means noisy jabber. Do you know in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul said three things should be silenced. The prof, the speaking in tongues if there's no interpreter. And something else I forget. And the noisy jabber of women. Now, when James was a baby, I figured out 1 Corinthians 14. I came out of the nursery one Sunday morning. I said, I figured it out. I know what Paul meant about noisy jabber. I was in a church, an independent Italian church in Chicago. And I was in the nursery with James. And we had those speakers where, you know, you could hear the pastor. And I was sitting there with another mother. And I was in Chicago kind of by myself, only in a house with four generations of Italians, and I never saw another person who was my age or gender with young children. And so Sundays were special. I got to see other people, you know what I mean? I got to see other people on Sunday. And I went in, and James is playing, and this other woman is talking to me, and I'm talking to her, and we're talking back and forth, and blah, 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 blah. It was noisy jabber. I didn't hear the service. I couldn't hear what the preacher was saying. She kept talking. Okay, I kept talking too. I figured out what noisy jabber was. 
And Deborah Gill said they went into a society where women had not gone to church before and had not been educated, and they went into this society, and the women came, and they were speaking in English and through an interpreter, and then the women would yell, would ask their husbands, what, what, what are they saying, what do they mean, what do they mean? Yep, and, and church services weren't like this. There wasn't a speaker and y'all sitting in the back. They were all sitting around, and they would talk, and everyone had a hymn or a song or a testimony or blah, 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 blah. And the women like to talk. So Paul said, hush. It's basically what he said. I say it 47 times a day. Hush, stop, shh. I'll tell you, this one child pulled out of here tonight yelling, bye, this is a speedo from the inside of his car. (laughs) You could hear it almost when he was still down sheets. I was like, oh, thank Lord, it's 315 at least once every 24 hours. <laughs> it's 3.15. Yodia and Syntyche were fellow workers in the ministry. Romans 16, Phoebe, Priscilla, Mary. Oh, Aquila shouldn't be in there. Uh, <laughs> Mary, Tripani, Tryphosa, Pers- Ten of the ministry workers listed in Romans 16 were women. Did you know that? Hard to tell with those names. Ten of the ministry workers in Romans 16 were women. Phoebe, oh, Phoebe's my favorite. Phoebe was a diaconess or minister of the church. Diaconess. Phoebe was a woman. Diaconess in the Greek is the male form of the word which means minister. It sounds like deacon, right? But she was a minister. She was a pastor. Anytime diakonos was used in the Greek, it referred to pastor, minister, except when they paired it with Phoebe because the translators got a little itchy. We can't put that in there. A woman minister? Oh. Hmm. New Testament church, Priscilla and Aquila were a couple in ministry. Anytime you see a couple mentioned, it's usually the male name before the female name. But Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned as a couple four times, and three of the four times Priscilla comes first because she was the ministry leader. She also wrote Hebrews, but that's a speculation. Priscilla taught Apollos. Priscilla taught a man under the commission of Paul in Ephesus. Wait a minute. Priscilla, a woman, taught a man under the commission of Paul, the apostle, in Ephesus. Ephesus was the church that received 1 Timothy 2, 11, 12, where they said a woman should be silent in the church. Now, why would Paul contradict himself that way? A woman should be silent in the church, but... Paul commissioned Priscilla to lead that church and to teach the men in that church. I had a teacher once who came to us from a different church. And I put her in the middle school. And she said, can I wear slacks? I said, yeah, you wear slacks. She said, is this right? You want me to teach the Bible to middle school boys? said, yeah. She came in the next week dressed in her slacks and said, I'm going to go teach Bible to middle school boys in my slacks. I said, yes, sister, you are. Because the closer you get to the Holy Spirit, the closer you get to God's ideal, which is that this message is so important we dare not eliminate 50% of the population. Hello? Hello? Absolutely. Okay. If y'all hate me, that's okay. God still loves me. Historical context disavows, disallows an interpretation that Paul, who had left Priscilla to pastor, was not prohibiting once and for all women as spiritual leaders. 
You can circle that, highlight that. There's a woman somewhere in your field of influence who needs that. There was a problem, though, in Ephesus. Heresy was being spread among the women. Those who were spreading the heresy had focused their efforts on women. Paul's remarks in 2 Timothy were aimed at correcting a heresy that was prohibiting marriage and was luring women away from sound doctrine. The passage was meant to silence the teaching of a heresy. A woman, I am not permitting, look at the next slide, I am not permitting a woman to teach. I am not permitting a woman to teach. I'm not permitting a woman. This is where I'm going to. I'm not permitting a woman. There was a woman who had not been educated, who was being led away by a heresy, and she had not been taught or instructed. And Paul, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, by God's great grace said, don't let that woman teach until she learns. What? Don't let that woman, a woman, that one woman at this time for this place, don't let her teach until she learns. And let her learn with quietness and submission. What? You go on and read that chapter. There were men who were also engaged in this heresy. Guess what Paul does to the men? He names them. I wish he didn't name the woman. But in God's grace, he didn't name the woman. He said, a woman, go back to the original Greek, it's a woman. That woman is not allowed to teach until she gets, that saying, Paul was saying, forget about the men. They were educated. They should know better. I'm calling them out because they're teaching heresy. But the woman, let's teach her. Let's teach her because she's got potential. Hello? Any sisters out here? Hello? God. The solution, she must learn. The only direct command in the whole chapter, she must be instructed, she must learn. He named the men. Do you mean to tell me that we have kept women from ministry for 2,000 years? Because of one woman? I don't know. Could be. But do you see God's grace? Because now, when someone gets on Facebook and tells me that my Bible is misogynistic, that my Bible doesn't honor women, I'm going to tell them something about my Bible. I'm going to tell them that the one they're serving, this, that Satan himself is the one who subordinates and pushes women under their heel, but that my God lifts women up, and my God protects women, and my God wants women to learn and to minister and do everything he has called them to do. Mary... What's her name? Mary Woodworth Etter. 1858, she was 13 years old. God called her to preach. She said, I can't preach, I'm a girl. She, got, she married a farmer. They had six children. Five of them died of illness. She came back to the Lord, and she found in Scripture that God used women she actually went to the source instead of listening to what people say. She went to the source. She found out that God used women. And she preached all over Ohio and Indiana. In Indiana, she had a service with 25,000 people. And her books reached all across the world as a missionary, um, as a missionary witness to the entire world. A woman. You know what I did one time? 
one time I was told I was in this church and I was sitting in the back and they came up to me and they said, you can pray after the service. Um, you can pray from right where you are. I said, okay. And I'm sitting there enjoying the service and I'm thinking, well, why would I pray from back there? I'll just come on up to the front and pray. Because I want to thank the people and you blah, blah, blah. Can't do it from back there. So I walked up to the front, and the guy in charge, he looked, oh, she's up here in the front. Okay. Handed me the mic. I thanked the people. I prayed. It was two days later I realized, uh-oh, I shouldn't have done that. I created a faux pas because I was a woman and I stood in the front of the church and said something. Ooh, I'm glad I'm Pentecostal. Anybody else glad you're Pentecostal tonight, huh? Anybody glad you're Pentecostal? God is in charge. God is in control. God is the one who is in authority. God puts up and God takes down. Hallelujah. Gender is not an issue in ministry. Look to the final slide, number 8, 19. God's creation... I. Deal affirms equality, mutuality, unity, and intimacy. These ideals were affirmed in the actions and teaching of Christ. New Testament theology reflects the teaching of Jesus. And the early church practiced the full ministry gifts for men and women. Let's become those New Testament early church believers tonight. Amen? Bow your heads with me. Father, I pray that this message will reach out to young women wherever they may be. And that they will know that if they are called of you, they are enabled by you, they are gifted by you, that you do not discriminate. And that you will use men and women in your service and for your glory. And we thank you for that tonight in Christ's name. For your glory. Amen. Have a good night, everybody.